Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens, southwoodgardencenter.com and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. On today's show, host Casey Hinches renovates our keyhole garden, builds a teepee trellis to go in the middle of it, and plants it with peas, lettuce, and kale. Gardener guy Paul James joins us to identify some bulletproof perennials to consider planting this spring. We simplify the science of fixing nitrogen, and we look at a sand hydroponic system. spring and it's time to start getting our beds prepared for planting. If you remember a couple of years ago we built a keyhole garden and I thought it'd be a time to go back in and take a look and see what's happened with the materials that we've added into our keyhole garden. You can see our cover crop is growing a little bit sparsely. It's been kind of a dry winter, um, but the whole soil profile has really shrunk down. So we're going to take this opportunity to see what's going on and then also to rebuild up the soil. You can see we've got our wheat and some of our legumes still growing and we put a chopped straw over it last fall. So here's some of the bamboo sticks that we kind of thought they would take a while to break down that are still in here. But we're not really finding any of our other sticks um, or any of our cardboard. And if you remember, we did put a little bit of soil on top, but look at how rich that soil is now. So you can see we've got great soil here and it's time to build more to it. Our cardboard has actually disappeared. Um, and it actually worked really well to keep the Bermuda grass out, but we went ahead and did install DG around there so that we don't have to be as concerned about it. So our cover crop is going to act like a nitrogen material, um, and so we're just going to cover that cover crop up. We want to put carbon on top of that. This time of year, it's a great uh, opportunity to collect some dead material. You can see we have a lot of ornamental grasses that we'll be doing some cutbacks with. Um, but we have a material here that's kind of a shredded uh, ornamental grass that we're going to use. So I'm just going to sprinkle this on top of our bed here. So you can see we've got quite a bit of carbon material here and it's stacked up pretty well. What we're going to now put on top is a soil level so that we'll have something to plant in. Of course, when we start planting, we will incorporate a little nitrogen to help break some of this carbon down. What we're using for our topsoil level is some topsoil, but then we're also going to mix in, you may remember our uh, drawer project that we did. It's kind of run its course and we've got some old potting soil in here. And it's really not good to use potting soil over and over again. So it's got a lot of roots and things like that in here. But we're going to add that to our uh, keyhole garden to give us a little bit of that soil media that we're looking for. So we're going to break these uh, root balls up. Um, we know there was no disease in our drawers, so we're not concerned about that. If you were concerned, if you had some plant loss or failures, then you might want to uh, not put this into your garden. Uh, we'll just add it in, and then we're going to also put some more topsoil to mix in with it. So now that we have our soil in here, you can see there's still some of those dried grasses sticking up out of here, but that's great. That's going to be excellent carbon material and add to organic material that's in our soil bed here. 
We've also got that green cover crop that's under there that's going to break down to continue to give us nitrogen. This is going to add to that soil uh, profile for us for great planting. We've added the mixed potting soil and some topsoil on top, so we've got a planting bed to go ahead and get our spring seeds in. We're just going to rake this smooth and make sure to taper it from our central compost pile. We'll just need to continue adding more compost material to that center basket, and that'll feed our keyhole garden. But other than that, we're ready to plant this spring. It's that time of year when we're all anxious to get out into nurseries and today we're at Southwood Landscape and Garden Center and look who's joining me. It's none other than Paul James. Greetings Casey, good Thank to have you. Thank you for having us again. We always love coming over here. Always our pleasure. And you've got some tough as nail perennials that you're going to show us today. I do and I love the plants whether regardless of whether they're annuals, perennials, whatever. The ones that are tough as nails a right. lot of people are looking for. Right. You don't have to mess with them too much. Topping the list among perennials has to be the daylilies. And perennials are ones that will come back year after year. Yes, yes. And Bless their hearts, they, <laughs> they come back. Most are very long-lived, too. Um, but holy cow, the daylilies, is there a more effortless plant on the planet? I don't I, think so. And they come in every color, it seems like. Mostly yellow today, but yeah, everything but the elusive blue. You know, if somebody finds that blue one, they're going to retire on their own private island. Well, that's any plant, really, right? <laughs> that's going to be a big money maker. Um, plant them once, enjoy them for years and years to come. Yeah. One of the things I love, the way to use these, is in combination with daffodils. Mm -hmm. So you put your daffodils in, you get the spring bloom, and then you don't like looking at that ugly, fading daffodil foliage. The daylilies come on, cover it up and give you that beautiful display. That's a perfect suggestion for a garden, you know? I mean, One of my favorite combos. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, what are some other perennials that we could put with these daffodils? Oh goodness, take your pick. <laughs> <laughs> Should you know, we get started? <laughs> well, I mean, not necessarily as a combination, but right here, mm -hmm. you've got the Artemisia. Okay. That too is just one of those super rugged plants that, uh, and of course, I'm, I'm always partial to things that maybe are a little bit gray. <laughs> um, just so easy to grow. What I love about it is the texture of it. It's a very soft form texture, and it, it does well in rock gardens, kind of softening those rocks and things. It's beautiful, loves the sun. Uh, it's an Oklahoma proven 1999. I'm not even sure you were born back then. <laughs> um, and totally deer resistant. Mm -hmm. Deer will not eat this. Oh, perfect. Even if this is their last meal on earth, they will not eat this, thank goodness. <laughs> um, right here, the, the Nepeta, the cat mint. Yes. These are just rugged as all get out as well, and I love them so much. Constantly blooming throughout the summertime, and if it does stop, you can just trim it back and and it'll flush out new foliage for you. And the butterflies on a warmer day <laughs> would be all over this stuff. And again, it's got that kind of greenish, uh, grayish blue foliage to it a little bit. Right. Which is a nice uh, combination. That's not an intentional theme today, by the way, but <laughs> that's the way it's going. And uh, right here, the Garas, a native. One of my favorites. I love them. I love them so much. This is the, the white form, but you know, it's available in the pink. Uh -huh. um, and really th this plant. one's got a red foliage to it here. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it's quite pretty. So even when you don't have the flowers, you've got some color interest with the foliage here. Exactly. Easy to grow. Needs some well-drained soil, but it'll take all the sun you want to throw at it. I think one of the names for this, the common names, is whirling butterflies, because it just looks like dancing butterflies above it does. the plant. It does. All right, for the next group, let's go that way. Let's go take a look. All right, what have we got here? Salvia, it looks like. The classic Maynite Salvia. It's been around a long time, still hugely popular. And again, just so easy to grow. Right, and um, I, I love the deep, deep purple that this comes in. I do too, and, and pretty drought resistant too, once it's established. But I gotta tell you, among the salvias. There's so many of them. <laughs> there are a lot of them, uh, but Salvia gregii, mm. which is, more shrub, more of a woody style right. perennial than an herbaceous one. Um, these, these to me are fantastic. Furman's red, very popular. 
just keeps on blooming and keeps on blooming. Yeah, yeah, and it's called autumn sage because it really puts on a big autumn show, but I mean, it's already blooming earlier in the season as well. I just realized there's another plant right behind oh. me that we need to talk about. <laughs> um, you know, the odd thing, where'd you go? I'm behind you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at other plants. <laughs> You're familiar with this. Yes, yeah, Solidago. Right. And a great native. Right. Um, but they're doing a lot more with the cultivars and stuff. What I don't understand is why it's in bloom right now. <laughs> really. Normally it's late summer, early fall. Yeah, right. yeah. But here it is in uh, May and we've got blooms already. But this this is Little Lemon and I actually have worked with this one. I love this one because it too. stays short. So often we think of Solidago being a little bit taller and flopping over, but right. this one is a nice petite one. Let's see, what's next? Now we gotta go that way. All right. <laughs> Casey, we, we couldn't talk about Tough as Nails Perennials without mentioning the Rude Beckias. Yes. These Black-Eyed Susans are just such a classic perennial flower. Mm -hmm. um, I love them because you kind of get that prairie look when you mix them with ornamental grasses. It's always been one of my favorite combinations. There you go. And they also come in a lot of different cultivars for different sizes, uh, different heights. Uh, so you can, you can get a lot of different uh, look with the same plant. Yeah. They're really pretty. All right, what if we are a gardener who doesn't like to water in August? <laughs> what what do we do? You mean me? <laughs> <laughs> then we look at the sedums. All right. Um, I love these. They are so easy to care for, easy to plant, and they'll spread, but not to the point of being invasive in my mind. Right, and what I love is look at the color that you can get without flowers. Right, right. Color, Which means it's going to be there all season long for you. Right. No right. deadheading, <laughs> no, no watering. No. What else could you want in a plant? And, you know, they when they do flower, it's a short-lived flower, but yeah. they're quite pretty. Yeah, some of them have these yellow flowers. There are some taller sedums that have purple flowers to them. And a lot of people don't realize that these are hardy here. Absolutely. So they're going to come back every year for you. You might just kind of break off the dead early in the spring and it'll reflush with new growth. I love these. Love them. You know, that the the other succulents, the, the not so hardy succulents are hugely popular now. Right. Um, but people forget that the perennial succulents, every bit is beautiful. Not quite as much variation in leaf size and shape and all that kind of stuff. Nevertheless, they're they're just awesome plants. Paul, as always, we enjoy coming out here and thank you for sharing some of your tough as nail perennials with us. Sure, I love to do it. I, I'm a little nervous being on TV, but, but <laughs> I'll know. get over it. I'll it's just it. between you and me. Okay. <laughs>we've got our keyhole bed prepped we're ready to start planting and one of the things that we're going to plant in our keyhole this year is some sugar snap peas sugar snap peas are a legume and since we have so much carbon material in the ground there we wanted to plant a legume this would not be an appropriate location for carrots or some of your taproot vegetables such as carrots and beets and radishes and things like that because they're going to come into those uh, obstacles as they grow so we're gonna do uh, snap peas in the center and then put some romaine lettuce and some kale around the edges. Now the snap peas that we're growing are gonna be quite tall. So we're gonna build us a teepee in order to support those peas. We started out by finding some branches that were about seven to eight feet long and we went ahead and cleaned up those branches pretty well. We did leave a few little twigs on each side and that's just gonna help uh, allow those peas to grab hold of those branches better. Once we got our branches cleaned up, we tied three of them together, starting out with a timber hitch and then lashing them and weaving them together and then finishing that lash with a clove hitch. So we've got those three lashed together and we're gonna use two more poles. And you can see our rope was about eight feet long. So we've got a little bit of extra to go ahead and tie in these other branches. So to give our peas a little something else to grow on, we're just going to use some smaller twine and tie it to the top of our teepee up here and then use that to uh, twine down around a little bit. Again, this doesn't have to be perfect and this is something that your 
kids can kind of help you with. Um, but this is just going to give you some horizontal support. So what this will do is give our peas a little bit more horizontal growth space and, and something else to cling to as they grow up our teepee here. So we've got two peas that we're going to plant on our teepee here. One is a, a purple magnolia tendril pea and it's actually one of the first purple shelled uh, snap peas that was developed and then we also have a golden sweet pea. These are taller peas and definitely need a trellis to grow on. They're going to get anywhere from six to eight feet tall. So we've got quite a structure here that we've built. And I'm going to kind of alternate the purple with the golden pea to hopefully add a nice display here. Now peas, again, are a fairly good sized seed. You can, obviously they look like peas that are a little bit dehydrated. So this is the golden sweet pea, and we're just going to put those about an inch to an inch and a half in the soil. And we can push those down with our finger, and we're going to put them about four inches apart. So we'll plant a few peas around each pole. So that's our golden sweet pea. And then we'll trade off with the magnolia purple snap pea. And both of these are edible in shell if they're harvested at the right time. And peas are something that you want to plant right now, uh, February through March in Oklahoma. They are a cool season crop, so we want to get those in the ground so that we can harvest them before our temperatures get too warm. So because we have a little bit more planting space, we're going to utilize that by planting some additional cool season crops. We've got some infrared romaine lettuce uh, that'll give us a nice contrast with some red foliage around one side of it. And then the other uh, thing that we have is some darkabore kale. And it's a kale that's got really curly leaves, um, which should make good kale chips because all of those curls in those leaves when they dry will hold the seasoning really well. So we'll have to get Barbara on that, but we're going to go ahead and get these planted today. Lettuce seed is really tiny, so we're just going to scatter this around our planting area. We just want to get some labels on our seeds so we know what's coming up. Um, and then, of course, we'll water those in. This teepee is a great way to add some vertical height in your vegetable garden. We all remember when our junior high science teacher made something bubble over or smoke. All of a sudden, science became fun and exciting. As somebody who won the most inquisitive award in third grade, I've always been fascinated with the how and the why of science especially when it comes to gardening. The more you get involved in something like gardening, your vocabulary often starts changing. We start using words like pinching, cut back, die back, broadleaf. For new gardeners, these words might seem intimidating and foreign. For older gardeners, you might know what these words mean and what that means to do in the garden, but do we really know what's happening in the garden? That's why we're introducing a new segment this season called Simple Science. During these segments, we're going to break down the science of gardening and explain what's happening in the garden when you do some of these tasks in a simple, straightforward, fun way. Let's get started. Simple Science. The simple science of fixing nitrogen. <sighs> Take a deep breath. You know that 78% of the air that we're breathing is actually made up of nitrogen. Yes, that same nitrogen that we're so often talking about putting on our plants. 
The problem is, is that the nitrogen that's in the air is a tightly bound molecule of N2. And this molecule of nitrogen is not usable by plants. It's like if I needed a writing utensil and somebody gives me an unsharpened pencil. Thanks, but what good is this gonna do me? Most plants need nitrogen in the form of nitrates or NO3 or ammonium or N H4. And these molecules are very rarely found in nature, so much so that we typically have to apply nitrogen to most plants. In our soil, it's soil bacteria that doesn't get enough credit. In fact, it's the bacteria and several different kinds of bacteria that are crucial to converting our atmospheric nitrogen into a usable form for plants. This takes several different types of bacteria and several different steps in order to make that nitrogen usable to plants. It's like taking several steps to get your pencil sharpened. However, there are certain plants known as legumes that are able to fix this problem. You see, legumes do what's called fixing nitrogen or nitrogen fixation. They have nodules on their roots which make a perfect place for certain bacteria to live. In exchange for having a place to live, this bacteria quickly converts atmospheric nitrogen into a usable form for plants. It's a symbiotic relationship. It's like having a quick way to sharpen that pencil. Because legumes can fix their own nitrogen, we typically don't think about fertilizing with nitrogen fertilizer on legume plants like we do other plants. In fact, that fixed nitrogen is not only accessible to legumes, but sometimes some nearby plants as well. Even more nitrogen is made available to nearby plants when we break down those legume plants and incorporate them into the soil. A couple of common legumes that you might be aware of are beans and alfalfa. But legumes are the only plants that really can fix nitrogen. All of our other plants rely on us providing them nitrogen in some form. But thanks to modern science, we can go down to our local nursery and get plant accessible nitrogen just as easily as, well, a pencil that doesn't need sharpening. Watering a garden is always one of the biggest questions people ask. And we are here at Pond Pro in Shawnee, and joining us is Mike Miller. And we're looking at a different type of water garden, if you will. This is actually a hydroponic system that you guys offer, and it's a vegetable garden. That's right. Tell it's, us about the system. It's sand hydroponics. It's okay. a little bit different than just growing in water like the hydroponics people are talking about. This one uses an epic chamber. Okay. EPIC stands for Environmentally Passive Integrated Chamber, okay, so E-P-I-C. You note that it has holes here on the bottom. Mm -hmm. This fits down against a rubber liner in this container, and you put gravel up to the sides here. The gravel disperses the water all the way across the bottom. And then the sand, which is all on top of this, this is a full bed of sand here, about 14 inches, and that sand then through capillary action absorbs all of the water and the roots grow way down to the bottom so you'll have a great root system that you might not have in other forms of gardening unless you've loosened your soil way down. Right, that's always one of the biggest things that we try to teach people is to do deep watering so that you encourage deep rooting. So you can feel this sand is wet but there's water all the way through it. How do I know when I need to fill this up? The top of the sand will become dry okay. so you can poke your finger in it and tell whether it's dry or not. The tubes here on the side, there's one on either side, 
and you would fill that up with water and or fertilizer that you might need to put in it because the sand is pretty neutral. The kit would come with the epic chamber, the liner and the underlayment and the pipes to fit it in there and then you would supply the frame that you make, could make out of simple treated lumber and the gravel and the sand that goes in the top of it. You can extend it as much as you want to. You could make it in four foot increments wide, four foot increments long and make it as large as you want to. And I would assume you would have less disease on your plants as well because you're not doing overhead watering and getting that water and splashing That's on right. the leaves. You're not going to have the growth of weeds infringing on your garden. You're not going to be watering from the top so your leaves aren't going to develop lots of different diseases and a lot of the pests aren't going to get in here that you would normally get. It's, it's tough for rabbits sometimes to climb up on here. Right. <laughs> well, thanks for sharing this kit with us. For the next three weeks, we will not be shown on the main OETA channel to make room for festival programming. You can find us throughout festival on OETA's Okla channel with best of Oklahoma gardening episodes exploring a vegetable field day, the Oklahoma food co-op, and master gardener programs throughout the state. We encourage you to consider supporting OETA during festival and be sure and join us back at our usual time and place March 24th as we kick the new growing season into high gear with more TV you'll grow to love. To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagarding.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Green Lake Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society. We hope you enjoyed this video. It's part of our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. You can also find even more videos on our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel. And join us on social media for great gardening tips, photos, and discussion.